The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, I guess we should start. Uh, this is the uh, this is the last of these lectures. Uh, final will be on uh, next Wednesday, as you uh, hope you all know by this time, in the ice rink, whatever that means. Uh, and uh, there was some question about how many sheets of paper you could bring in as a as crib sheets, uh, and uh, seems like the reasonable thing is four sheets which means you can bring in the two sheets you made up for the quiz plus two more, or you can make up four new ones if you want or do whatever you want. Uh, I don't think it's very important how many sheets you bring in because uh, uh, I've never seen anybody referring to their sheets. That's, uh, I mean, you, it's a good way of organizing what you know to try to put it on four sheets of paper. So, uh, okay, I want to, mostly review what we've done throughout the term uh, with a few more general comments thrown in. Uh, I thought I'd start with martingales because uh, we didn't completely finish what we wanted to talk about last time and the strong law of large numbers was left uh, slightly hanging and I want to show you how to do that in a, in a little better way uh, and also show you that it's uh, a more general theorem than it appears to be at first sight. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go with martingales. The basic definition is a sequence of random variables is a martingale uh, if for all elements of the sequence the expected value of uh, Zn given all of the previous values as equal to the random variable z n minus one. Uh, remember, and we've talked about this a number of times, uh, when you're talking about the expected value of one random variable given a bunch of other random variables, you're only taking the expectation over the first part. You're only taking the expectation over z sub n, and the other, other quantities are still random variables. Namely, you have an expected value of z sub n for each sample value of Zn minus one all the way down to Z1. And what the definition says is it's a martingale uh, only if for all sample values of those earlier values, uh, the expected value is equal to the sample value <coughs> of the most recent one. Namely, the memory is all contained right in this last term, effectively, at least as far as expectation is concerned. Memory might be uh, far broader than that for everything else. The first thing we did with martingales is we said uh, the expected value of Zn, if you're only given part of the history, if you're only given the history from i back to 1 where i is strictly less than n minus 1, uh, that expected value is equal to Zi. So no matter where you start going back, the expected value of z sub n is the, is, the, is the most recent value that is given. Uh, so if the most recent value given is z1, then the expected value of zn given z1 is z1. Uh, and also along with that, you have the relationship the expected value of zn is equal to the expected value of zi just by taking the expected value over z sub i. So that's, all of that's uh, sort of straightforward. Uh, we talked a good deal about the increments of a martingale. The increments x sub n equals z sub n minus z n minus one uh, are very much like the increments that we have on a, on a renewal process, on a Poisson process. All of these processes we talked about we can define in various ways. Uh, and here we can define a martingale in two ways also. One is by the actual martingale itself, uh, which are, in a sense, the sums of the increments. And the other way is in terms of the increments. And the increments satisfy the property that the expected value of xn, given all the earlier values, 
is equal to zero. Namely, no matter what all the earlier values are, x sub n has mean zero in order to be a martingale. A uh, good special case of this is where x sub n is equal to u sub n times y sub n, where the u sub n are uh, iid, uh, equiprobable, one and minus one, and the y sub i's are anything you want them to be. Uh, it's just that the u sub i's have to be independent of the, of the y sub i's. So, so I think this shows that, that in fact, martingales are, uh, are really a pretty broad class of things. And they were, and they were invented to talk about fair gambling games, where, where they wanted to give the gambler the opportunity to do whatever he wanted to do, but the game itself was defined in such a way that no matter what you do, the game is fair. Uh, you establish bets in, on whatever things you want to, and when you wind up with it, uh, the expected value of x sub n, given the past, is always zero. Uh, and that's equivalent to saying the expected value of z sub n, given the past, is equal to z sub i. Okay, examples we talked about are zero mean random walks and products of unit mean iid random variables. So they're both these product martingales and there are these sum martingales, uh, and those are just two simple examples uh, which come up all the time. Okay, then we talked about sub martingales. A sub martingale is like a martingale except it grows with time. Uh, and uh, we're not going to talk about super martingales because a super martingale is just a negative sub martingale, so we don't have to talk about that. A martingale is a sub martingale, so anything you know about sub martingales applies to martingales also. So you can state theorems for sub martingales and they apply to martingales just as well. You can say stronger things very often about martingales. Uh, and then we have the same theorem for sub-martingales. Uh, now that, that should say, and it did say until my evil twin got a hold of it, if Zn is a sub-martingale, then for n greater than i, greater than zero, uh, this expected value is greater than or equal to Zi, and the expected value of Zn is greater than or equal to the expected value of Zi. In other words, this theorem for sub-martingales is the same as the corresponding theorem for martingales, except now you have inequalities there, uh, just like you have inequalities in the definition of the sub-martingale. So there's nothing, nothing strange there. Then we found out that if you have a convex function from the reals into the reals, then Jensen's inequality says that the expected value of h of x is greater than or equal to h of the expected value of x. We showed a picture for that. You remember there's a convex curve. There's some straight line. And what, that, what Jensen's inequality says is you take an average over the expected value of x and you're somewhere above the line. And you take the average first and you're sitting on the line. So. Uh, if h of x is convex, that's what Jensen's inequality is. And it follows from that that if Zn is a sub-martingale, and that includes martingales, uh, and h is convex, uh, and the expected value of h of x is finite, then h of Zn is a martingale also. Okay, in other words, if you have a martingale, z sub n, the expected value of z sub n is a sub-martingale. Uh, the expected value of e to the r c n is a martingale. You use whatever convex function you want to, and you wind up martingales go into sub-martingales. So uh, you, can't, you can't get out of the range of marting sub-martingales that easily. Okay, we then talked about stopped martingales and stopped sub-martingales. We said a stop process uh, for a possibly defective stopping time. Now, you remember what a stopping time is. A stopping time is a random variable, which is a function of everything that takes place up until the time of stopping. Uh, and you have to look at the definition carefully because stopping 
stopping time comes in too many places to, to just say it and understand what it means. But, but it's clear what it means if, you're, if you view yourself as an observer watching a sequence of random variables, of sample values of random variables one after another. And after you see a certain number of random variables, uh, your rule says stop. And then you don't observe any more. So you just observe this finite number. And then you stop at that point, and then you're all done. Uh, if it's a possibly defective stopping rule, then you might keep on going forever, or you might stop. You don't know what you're going to do. OK. Uh, the, uh, the stopped process, C sub n star, is a little different from what we were doing before. Before, what we were doing is we were sitting there observing this process. At a certain point, the stopping rule said stop. And uh, before, uh, we were very obedient. And when the stopping rule told us to stop, we stopped. Uh, now, uh, since we know a little more, we question authority a little more. And when the stopping rule says stop, we break things into two processes. There's the original process, which keeps on going. Uh, and there's a stop process, which just stops. And it's convenient to have a stop process instead of just a stopping rule. Because with the stop process, you can look at it any time into the future. And if it's already stopped, you know what the stop value is. You know what it was when, it's, when it stopped. You don't necessarily know when it stopped by looking at it in the future. But you know that it did stop. OK, so the stop process uh, it's, and, well, it says here what it is. Uh, it satisfies. The stop value at time n is equal to z sub n if n is less than or equal to the stopping time j. And z sub n star is equal to z sub j if n is greater than j. So you get up to the stopping time and you stop, and then it just stays fixed forever after. And the nice theorem there uh, is that the uh, stop process for a sub-martingale uh, with a possibly defective stopping rule is a sub-martingale again. What that means is it's just a concise way of writing. The stop process for a martingale is a martingale in its own right. And the stop process for a sub-martingale is a sub-martingale in its own right. OK, so, you, so, so the convenient thing is you can take a martingale, you can stop it, you still have a martingale. And everything you know about martingales applies to the stopping process. So, we, so we're getting to the point where starting out with a martingale, we can do lots of things with it. And that's the whole, that's the whole mathematical game. With a mathematical game, you build up theorems from nothing. Uh, as an experimentalist or an engineer, uh, uh, you sort of try to figure out those things from uh, 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 you try to figure out those things from, from the reality around you. Here, we're just building it up. Uh, and uh, the other part of that theorem says that the expected value of z1 is less than or equal to the expected value of zn star, is less than or equal to the expected value of zn for a sub-martingale, and they're all equal for a martingale. In other words, the marginal expectations uh, for a martingale, they start out at z1, they stay at z1, and for the stop process, they stay at that same value. And that's not too surprising. Uh, uh, because if you have a martingale, uh, if, you, if you go until you reach the stopping point, from that stopping point on, the martingale has mean 0 from that point on. Uh, not, not the martingale itself, but the, but the increments of the martingale have mean zero from that point on. Uh, and the stop process has mean zero. In other words, the stop process, the increments are, are actually zero, whereas for the original process, the increments wobble around, but they still have mean zero. So this is a very nice and useful thing to know. Uh, if you look at this product martingale, z sub n, is e to the r sn minus n gamma of r. Why is that a martingale? 
How do you know it's a martingale? Well, you look at the expected value of this, and it's the expected value of this. The expected value of e to the rsn uh, is the moment generating function of z sub n, uh, of s sub n. It's the moment generating function of e to the rsn. Uh, and the moment generating function of e to the rsn is just uh, e to the n gamma of r. So, uh, this is clearly uh, something which uh, should be a martingale because it just keeps at that level all along. If you have a stopping rule, such as a threshold crossing, then you get a stop martingale. And uh, subject to some little mathematical nitpicks which the text talks about, this leads you to the much more general version of Wald's, equality, Wald's identity, uh, which says that the expected value uh, of z at the time of stopping is equal to the expected value of e to the rsj minus j gamma of r equals 1. This, you remember, is what Wald's identity was when we were just talking about random walks. And this is, this is a more general version because it's talking about general, general stopping rules instead of just two thresholds. Uh, but it does have these little mathematical nitpicks in it, uh, which I'm not going to talk about here. OK, then we have Kolmogorov's sub-Martingale inequality. Uh, we talked about all of these things last time, so we're going pretty quickly through them. Uh, the sub-Martingale inequality is, is really the Markov inequality uh, souped up. Okay? And what it says is if you have a non-negative sub-Martingale, that can include a non-negative Martingale uh, for any positive integer m, the probability that the maximum of the z sub i's from 1 to m is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of z sub m over a. You see that all that the uh, uh, Markov inequality says is the probability that z sub m is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to this. this puts a lot more teeth into it because it lets you talk about all of these random variables up until time m, and it says the maximum of them satisfies this inequality. I mean, we always knew that the Markov inequality was very, very weak. Uh, and this is also pretty weak, but it's not quite as weak because it covers a lot more things. If you have a non-negative martingale, this is sub-martingales, this is martingales. You see here, with sub-martingales, the expected value of z sub m keeps increasing with m. So, it's, uh, so there's a trade-off between making m large and not making m large. If you're dealing with a, uh, if you're dealing with a martingale, then expected value of z sub m is constant over all time. It doesn't change. And therefore, you can take this inequality here. You can go to the limit as m goes to infinity and you wind up with the probability that the soup of Zn greater than or equal to A is less than or equal to expected value of the first of those random variables, expected value of Z1 divided by A. Okay? So this looks like a very powerful inequality. Uh, it turns out that I don't know many applications of that, uh, and I don't know why. It seems like it ought to be very useful, uh, but I know one reason which is what I'm going to show you next, which is how you can really use the sub-Martingale inequality to make it do an awful lot of things that you wouldn't imagine that it could do otherwise. OK, first you go to the Kolmogorov version of the Chebyshev inequality. This has the same relationship to the, to the Kolmogorov sub-Martingale inequality as Chebyshev has to Markov. Uh, Namely, what you do is instead of looking at the random variables uh, z sub n, you look at the random variables z sub n squared. Uh, and what do we know now? If z sub n is a martingale or a sub-martingale, z sub n squared is a martingale or sub-martingale also. Namely, uh, well, uh, the only thing we can be sure of is that z sub n squared is a 
is a submartingale. But if it's a submartingale, then we can apply this, this inequality again. And what it tells us in this case is the probability to maximum of the magnitudes of these random variables. Probably well, the maximum is greater than or equal to b, is less than or equal to the expected value of z sub m squared over b squared. So before, just like the Markov inequality, the Markov inequality only works for non-negative random variables. You go to the Chebyshev inequality because that works for, for negative or positive random variables. So that makes it kind of neat. Uh, and then uh, what you have is this thing, which goes down as 1 over b squared, which looks a little stronger. But that's not, not the real reason that you want to use it. OK, now this inequality here only works for the first m values uh, of this random variable. What we're usually interested in here is what happens as m gets very large. As m gets very large, uh, this thing very often blows up. So this alone does not really do what you would like an inequality to do. So what we're going to do is first we're going to say, if you have this inequality here, then you can lower bound this by taking just a maximum not over 1 up to m, but only over m over 2 up to m. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, hold on and you'll see. Uh, but anyway, this is bigger than, greater than or equal to this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this inequality, we're going to use it for m equals 2 to the k, for m equals 2 to the k plus 1, m equals 2 to the k plus 2, all the way up to infinity. And uh, so we're going to find the probability of the union over j greater than or equal to k of this quantity here, but now just maximized over 2 to the j minus 1, less than n, less than or equal to 2 to the j, and then the maximum of z sub n greater than or equal to. And now, for each one of these j's here, we'll put in whatever b sub j we want. So the general form of this inequality then becomes, we, we have this term in the left, uh, we use the union bound, and we get this term on the right. Okay, so at this point, we have an inequality which works for all n instead of just, just for values smaller than some given amount. So this is sort of a general technique for taking an inequality which only works up to a certain value and extending it so it works over all values. You have to be pretty careful about how you choose b sub j. Now what we're going to do is say, OK, and remember, what, what is happening here is we started out with a sub-martingale or a martingale. When we take zn squared, we still have a sub-martingale. So we can use the sub-martingale inequality, which is what we're doing here. We're using the sub-martingale inequality on zm squared rather than on zm. And zm squared is non-negative, so that works there. Then we go down to this point. We take a union over all of these terms. And note what happens. Every n is included in one of these terms, every n beyond 2 to the k. So if we want to prove something about the limiting values of z sub n, we have everything included there, everything beyond 2 to the k. But as far as the limit is concerned, you don't care about the first, any initial finite set. You care what happens after that initial finite set. OK, so what we have then is of these terms less than or equal to this term. When I apply this to a random walk, S sub n, uh, S sub n is a, uh, is a sub-martingale uh, at this point. Uh, the expected value of x squared we'll assume is sigma squared. The expected value now uh, s sub n, or z sub n, as we'll call it, 
is the sum of these n uh, iid random variables. So the expected value, uh, the expected value of z to the 2j is just 2 to the j times the expected value of x squared, in other words, sigma squared. Just doing this for a zero mean variable because An arbitrary non-zero mean random variable, you can look at it as the mean plus a random variable, which is zero mean. So that's the, that's the same idea as we're using here. OK, so we take this inequality now. And I'm going to use for b sub j 3 halves to the j. Why 3 halves to the j? Well, you'll see in just a second. But when I use 3 halves to the j here, I get the maximum over s sub n greater than or equal to 3 halves to the j. And over here, I get b sub j squared is 9 fourths to the j. And here I have a 2 here. I, uh, uh, I have a 2 to the j here also. So when I sum this, it winds up with 8 ninths to the k times 9 sigma squared. OK, so what I have now is something where when k gets larger, this term is going to 0. And I have something over here. Well, that doesn't look quite so attractive, but just wait a minute. What I'm really interested in is not s sub n, but I'm interested in s sub n over n. For the strong law of large numbers, I'd like to show that s sub n over n approaches a limit. And n, in this case, runs between 2 to the j minus 1 and 2 to the j. So when I put that in here, uh, we'll see what that amounts to in the next slide. For the strong law of large numbers, uh, what our theorem says is that the probability of the set of sample points for which s sub n over n equals 0, that set of sample points, has probability 1. OK, so the proof of that, I pick up this equation from the previous slide. And when I, upper, when I lower bound the left side of this, uh, what I'm going to get, I'm going to divide by n here. And I'm going to divide by something a little bit smaller, which is 2 to the j minus 1 here. So I get the maximum of s sub n over n greater than or equal to 2 times 3 quarters to the j. Now you see why I picked uh, 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 I think you see at this point why I picked b sub j the way I did. I wanted to pick it to be smaller than 2 to the j, and I wanted to pick it to be uh, 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 big enough that it drove the right-hand term to 0. OK, so, so now we're done, really. Because if I look at this expression here, a sample sequence, s sub n of omega, that's not contained in this union, has to approach 0, because, because these terms from 2 to the j minus 1 to 2 to the j, uh, in order to be in this set, they have to be greater than or equal to 2 times 3 quarters to the j. As j gets larger and larger, this term goes to 0. Uh, so the only terms that exceed that are terms that are arbitrarily small. So the uh, so the complement of this set is the set of terms uh, for which uh, s sub n over n does not approach 0. But the probability of that is 8 ninths to the k times, times some garbage over here. So now this is true for all k. The, uh, the terms which approach 0, namely the terms which are, uh, namely the that. Yeah. The, the sample values for which s sub n over n approaches 0 are, the, uh, are all complementary to this set. Uh, so the probability that s sub n over omega uh, over n uh, approaches 0 is greater than 1 minus this quantity here. That's true for all k. And since it's true for all k, this term goes to 0, and the theorem is proven. Okay. Now, why did I want to go through this? 
there are perhaps easier ways to prove the strong law of large numbers, uh, uh, just, just assuming that the variance is, uh, is finite. Why this particular why? Well, if you look at this, it applies to much more than just sums of IID random variables. It applies to arbitrary martingales, uh, so long as these conditions are satisfied. Uh, it applies to these cases like where you have a random variable, uh, which is plus or minus one times some arbitrary random variable. So this gives you sort of a general way of proving strong loss of large numbers for kind of strange sequences of random variables. Uh, so, so that's the reason for going through this. We now have a way of proving strong laws of large numbers for, uh, for lots of different kinds of martingales rather than just for, just for this set of things here. OK, so let's, let's move on. Uh, back to uh, Markov chains, uh, countable or finite state. So I'm moving back to uh, chapters 3 and 5 in the text, mostly chapter 5, and trying to finish some sort of review of what we've done. Uh, when I look back at what we've done, it seems like we've proven an awful lot of theorems. Uh, so all I can do is talk about the theorems. Uh, I should say something again this, this last day uh, on this last lecture about why we spend so much time proving theorems. In other words, we've just proven a theorem here. Uh, I promised you I would prove a theorem every, uh, every lecture, uh, along with, with talking about why they're important and so on. Uh, and most of you are engineers uh, or you're scientists in various fields. You're not mathematicians. Why should you be interested in all these theorems? Why should you, why should you take abstract courses uh, which look like math courses. Uh, and the reason is this kind of stuff is more important for you than it is for mathematicians. And it's more important for you because when you're dealing with a real engineering or real scientific problem, how do you deal with it? I mean, you have a real mess facing you. You spend a lot of time trying to understand what that mess is all about. Uh, and you don't form a model of it, and then apply theorems. What you do is to try to understand it, you look at multiple models. When we were looking at, at hypothesis testing, we said we're going to assume a priori probabilities. I lied about that a little bit. We were not assuming a priori probabilities. We were assuming a class of probability models, uh, each of which had a priori probabilities in them. And then we said something about that class of probability models. And in saying something about that class of probability models, we were able to say a great deal more than you can say if you refuse to even think about a model which doesn't have a priori probabilities in it. So by looking at lots of different models, uh, you can understand an enormous number of things without really having any one model which describes the whole situation for you. And, and that's why we try to prove theorems for models, because then when you understand lots of simple models, you have these complicated physical situations, and you play with them. You play with them by applying various simple models that you understand to them. And as you do this, you gradually understand the physical process better. Uh, and that's the way we discover things. OK, end of lecture. Not end of lecture, but end of, <laughs> end of partial lecture about, about why you want to learn some mathematics. Uh, OK, the first passage time from state i to j, remember, is the smallest n when you start off in state i uh, at which you get to state j. You start off in state i. Uh, you jump from one lily pad to another. You eventually wind up at lily pad number j. And we want to know how long it takes you to get to j. That's a random variable, obviously. Uh, and uh, this tij is a possibly defective random variable that has the probability mass function 
This just is, is the definition of what this probability mass function is. And it has a distribution function. And the probability mass function, uh, you probably remember how we derived this. We derived it by sort of crawling up on it, by looking at it for subsequent, for, uh, first for n equals 1, in which case it's just a transition probability, uh, then n equals 2, in which case it's the probability that you first go to k, and then in n minus 1 steps, you go to j. Uh, if, but you have to leave j out, because if you go to j in the first step, you don't. Uh, you've already had your first passage. OK, so we define a state to be recurrent uh, if t sub j j is non-defective, and we uh, define it to be transient otherwise. In other words, if it's, not, if it's not certain that you ever get to state j, then you define it to be transient. If it's recurrent, it's positive recurrent if the expected value of t sub j j is less than infinity, and it's null recurrent otherwise. Uh, how do we know how to analyze this? Well, we study renewal processes. And if you look at the renewal process, where you get a renewal every time you hit state j, you start out in state j, first time you hit state j, that's a renewal. The next time you hit state j, that's another renewal. The, you have a renewal process where the time, where the inner renewal time is a random variable, which has the, the PMF uh, f sub i j event. Okay, uh, and uh, excuse me, if you have a renewal process, if you start in state j, where t sub j j is the amount of time before a renewal occurs, from that time on, you got another review, uh, renewal uh, with another random variable, the same distribution as t j j, and f sub i j is the PMF of that, uh, of that renewal time, and F sub i j is the, uh, blah, 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 is the distribution function of it. OK, so then when we define a state j as being recurrent, uh, what we're really doing is going back to what we know about renewal processes and saying a, uh, a Markov chain is recurrent if the if the renewal process that we've defined for that uh, countable state Markov chain uh, has, uh, has these various properties uh, uh, for this renewal random variable. OK, for each recurrent j, there's an integer renewal counting process, n sub j j of t. Uh, you start in state j at time t, which is after uh, t steps of the Markov process. Uh, what you're interested in is how many times have you hit state j up until time t. That's the counting process we talk about in renewal theory. Uh, so n sub j j of t is the number of visits to j starting in j. And it has the inner renewal distribution, f sub j j, which is that quantity up there. We have a delayed renewal counting process, uh, n sub i j of t if we count visits to j starting in i. Uh, we didn't talk much about delayed renewal processes, uh, except for pointing out that when you have a delayed renewal process, it really is the same as a renewal process. You just have some arbitrary amount of time that's required to get to state j for the first time, and then you keep recurring on. Even if the expected time to get to j for the first time is infinite, uh, and the expected time for renewals from j to j is finite, you still have this same renewal process. You can, you can even lose an infinite amount of time at the beginning, uh, and you amortize it over time. Don't ask me why you can amortize an infinite amount of time over time, but you can. OK. And actually, if you, uh, if you read about the late renewal processes, you see why you actually get that. OK, so all states in a class are positive recurrent, or all are null recurrent, or all are transient. We, we've proved that theorem. 
wasn't really a very hard theorem to prove, uh, and you can sort of see that it ought to be. Uh, okay, then we define the chain as being irreducible if all state pairs communicate. In other words, if for every pair of states, there's a path that goes from one state to the other state. This is, this is intuitively a simple idea if you have a finite state Markov chain. If you have a countably infinite state Markov chain, uh, it, it seems to be a little more peculiar, but it really isn't. Uh, for, a, in, for a countably infinite state Markov chain, every state has a finite number. Uh, and you can take every pair of states, you can identify them, and you can see whether there's a path going from one to the other. For all of these birth-death processes we've talked about, uh, I mean, it's obvious whether the states all communicate or not. You just see if there's any, any break in the chain at any point. And it really looks like a chain. It's a node, two, <laughs> two transitions, another node, two transitions, another node. Uh, and it's uh, just the way chains are supposed to work. OK, so anyway, an irreducible class uh, might be positive recurrent. It might be null recurrent, or it might be transient. Uh, and we already have seen what, what makes a state no recurrent or transient. Uh, and uh, it's the same thing for the class. Namely, we've shown that, that a, uh, well, blah. OK, we started out by saying a state is either no recurrent, uh, positive recurrent, or transient. Uh, depending on this renewal process associated with it. And now there's this theorem which says that if one node in a class of states uh, is positive recurrent, they all are. And you ought to be able to sort of see the reason for that. If I have one state which is positive recurrent, it means that the expected time to go from this state to this state is finite. Now, if I have some, some other state, I have to go from here to there. I can go through here and then off to there. So the amount of time it takes me to get to there and then from there to there is also finite, expected amount, and the same backwards. So that was the way we proved this. OK, if we have an irreducible Markov chain, there's, now, this is the theorem you really use all the time. Uh, this, uh, this sort of says how you, how you operate with these things. It says the steady state equations, uh, they're the equations you, you've used in half the problems you've done with Markov chains. If these equations have a solution for the pi sub j's, OK, remember, the Markov chain is defined in terms of the transition probabilities, p sub i j. Uh, we solve these equations to find out what the steady state probabilities, pi sub j, are. And the theorem says, if you can find a solution to those equations, pi sub j's have to add up to 1, uh, then the solution is unique. The pi sub j's are equal to 1 over the mean uh, uh, one over the mean time to go from that state uh, back to that state again. Uh, and what does that mean? What that really gives you is not a way to find pi sub j. Uh, it gives you a way to find uh, uh, t sub j j, OK? Uh, because these equations uh, are more often the way that you solve for the steady state probabilities. And then that gives you a way to find the mean recurrence time uh, between visits to this given state. Uh, and uh, what else does this theorem say? It says if the states are positive recurrent, uh, then the steady state equations have a solution. So this is an if and only if kind of statement. Uh, it relates these equations, these steady state equations, to solutions uh, and says, if you can solve these equations, if these equations have a solution, then in fact you have the steady state equations 
They satisfy all these relationships about mean recurrence time. Uh, and if the states are positive recurrent, then those equations have a solution. And in the solutions, the pi sub j's are all positive. OK, so an infinite set of equations, so you can't necessarily solve it. Uh, but you sort of know everything there is to know about it at this, at this point. Well, there's one other thing. When you have a birth-death chain, these equations simplify a great deal. OK, the counting processes under positive recurrence have to satisfy uh, this equation. And my evil twin brother got a hold of this and left out the n in the copy that you have. Uh, and I spotted it when I looked at it uh, just, just a little bit. Uh, he was still sleeping, so I managed to find it. And, uh, so it's corrected here. And what does that say? It says when you have positive recurrence, if you, if you look from 0 out to t, and you count the number of times that you hit state j, that's a random variable. If you take that and divide by n, you, you look from time 0 out to time n, n sub ij of n is the number of times you visit state j. You divide that by n, and you go to the limit. And there's a strong law of large numbers there which was a strong law of large numbers for renewal processes, which says that has a limit with probability 1. And this says that limit is pi sub j. And that's sort of obvious again. I mean, visualize what happens. You start out in state j. For one unit of time, you're in state j. Then you go away from state j, and for a long time, you're out in the wilderness. And then you finally get back to state J again. Think of, a, I think of a renewal reward process where you get one unit of reward every time you're in state J and zero reward every time you're not in state J. That means every, every inter-renewal period, you pick up one unit of reward, which says that the, well, this is what that says. Uh, it says that the, that the, it says that the fraction of those visits to state j uh, says that the, out of the total visits in the Markov chain, the ones that go to state j have probability pi sub j. Okay. So again, this is another relationship with these steady state probabilities. The steady state probabilities tell you what these mean recurrence times are, uh, and that tells you what this is. This, in a sense, uh, is the same as this. There's no, uh, those are just sort of the same results, uh, so there's nothing special about it. We talked a little bit about the Markov model of age of renewal process. For any integer valued renewal process, uh, you can find a Markov chain which gives you the age of that, uh, of that process. Uh, you visualize being in state j, and you visualize being in state 0 of this uh, Markov model uh, at the point where you have a renewal. One step later, if you have another renewal, that happens with probability p sub 0, 0. You go back to state 0 again. Uh, if you don't have a renewal in the next time, you go to state 1. Uh, from state 1, you might go to state 2. When you're in state 2, it means you're two time units away from state 0. Uh, if you go back to state 0, it means you have a renewal uh, in, in three time units. Uh, Otherwise, you go to state 3, then you might have a renewal, and so forth. Uh, so for this, this very simple kind of, uh, of, of Markov chain, uh, this tells you everything there is to know, in the sense, about integer-valued renewal processes. So there's this nice connection between the two. And it lets you see pretty easily about 
when you have no recurrence. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about these birth-death Markov chains. Uh, and the easy way to solve for birth-death Markov chains is to say intuitively that between any two states and between any two adjacent states, the number of times you go up has to equal the number of times you go down, plus or minus one. You start out here and you end up here. You've gone this way one more time than you've gone that way, and vice versa. Uh, and combining that with these steady state equations that we now have been talking about, uh, it must be that the steady state probability of pi sub i, pi sub i times p sub i is the probability of going from state two to state three. It's the probability of being in state two and making a transition to state three. Uh, this probability here is the probability of being in state three and going to, uh, and going to state two. And we're saying that asymptotically, as you look over an infinite number of transitions, those two have to be the same. Uh, the other way to do it, if you like algebra, is to start out with the steady state equations and you can derive this right away. Uh, I think it's nicer to see intuitively why it has to be true. Uh, and what that says is uh, if rho sub i is equal to p sub i over q sub i plus 1, uh, p sub i is the up uh, transition probability, q sub i is a down transition probability, rho sub i is the, uh, is the ratio of the two state probabilities, and that's equal to this equation here. Uh, okay, that's just how to calculate these things, and you've done that. Okay, let's go on to Markov processes. Uh, I have no idea whether I'm going to finish. Oh, I have a lot to do, so I better, uh, I better not waste too much time. Okay, remember what a Markov process is now. Uh, it's a uh, or at least the way we started out thinking about it. Uh, it's a Markov chain along with a holding time in each state of the Markov chain. And the holding times are exponential to be a, a countable state Markov process. So we can visualize it as a sequence of states, x0, x1, x2, x3, uh, and a sequence of holding times, u1, u2, u3, u4, uh, these are all random variables. And this kind of dependence diagram says what random variables depend on what random variables. U1 given x0 is independent of the rest of the world. U2 given x1 is independent of the rest of the world, and so forth. Uh, and if you look at this graph here, and you visualize the fact that because of Bayes' rule, you can go both ways on this. Okay, in other words, if, if this, given this, is independent of everything else, uh, we can go through the same kind of argument uh, and we can, uh, uh, we can make these arrows go the opposite way and we can say if we just consider these states here, uh, we can say that given x3, u4 is independent of x2, uh, and also independent of u3 and x1 and u2 and so forth. So, uh, so if you look at the dependence graph of a Markov chain, which is which states depend on which other states, uh, those arrows there that we have, which make it easy to see what's going on, you can take them off, you can redraw them in any way you want to uh, and look at the dependences in, an ops in, in the opposite way. Okay, now to, uh, to understand what the state is at any time t, uh, there's an equation to do that. Uh, it's an equation that isn't much help. Uh, I think it's more help to look at the, uh, I mean, to look at this and to see from this what's going on. You start in some state x0, okay, which is, uh, and starting in state zero, there's a holding time in u0. The holding time 
focus u1 and you stay in and the uh, and the time in u1 is an exponential random variable with rate nu sub i that's what this says so at the end of that holding time you go from state i to some other state this is the state you go to the state you go to is according to the Markov chain probabilities and at state j in this case uh, you stay in state j until the holding time u2 which is a function of j uh, finishes you up at this time and so forth so that if you want to look at what time what state you're in at a given time namely pick a time here and say what's the state at this time as a random variable so what you have to do then uh, is you have to climb your way up from here to there uh, and, uh, and you have to talk about uh, the value of S1, S2, and S3 uh, and those are exponential random variables but they're exponential random variables that depend on the state that you're in so as you're climbing your way up and looking at the sample function of the process you have to look at u1 and x0 x0 defines what u1 is as a random variable it says that u1 is an exponential random variable with rate uh, nu sub i so you get to here then you have some holding time here which is a function of j and so forth the whole way up so uh, which is why I said that an equation for x of t in terms of these s's uh, is not going to help you a great deal understanding how the process is working I think helps you a lot more we said that there were three ways to represent a Markov process uh, which I'm giving here in terms just of uh, 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 just of Markov chains uh, the first one and the fact that these are all for MM1 doesn't make any difference. It's just these, these three general methods. Uh, one of them is you look at it in terms of the embedded Markov chain. Uh, and for the embedded Markov chain, uh, for this embedded Markov chain, the transition probabilities when you're in state zero in an MM1Q, what's the next state you go to? Well, the only state you can go to is state 1 uh, because we don't have any soft transitions. So you go up to state 1 eventually. From state 1, you can go that way with probability mu over lambda plus mu, or you can go this way with probability lambda over lambda plus mu, and so forth the whole way out. Uh, the next way of describing it, which is almost the same uh, is instead of using the transition probabilities in the embedded chain you look directly at the transition rates uh, for the Poisson process I mean the transition rates are the are the, are the new sub i's associated with the different states when you get in state i the amount of time that you spend in state i uh, is an exponential random variable and when you make a transition you're either going to go to one state or another state in this case in general you might go to any any one of a number of states now uh, if I tell you that we start out in state one uh, and the next state we go to is state two and I ask you what's the expected amount of time that that transition took what's the answer is it q12 or is it nu sub 1 anybody awake out there <laughs> sir could you repeat the question uh, yes the question is we start out in state 1 given that we start out in state 1 and given that the next state is state 2 what's the amount of time that it takes to go from 1 to 2 it's an exponential random variable what's the rate of that random variable lambda plus mu what lambda plus mu uh, lambda plus mu yes lambda plus mu in the case of an mm1q uh, 
uh, if you have an arbitrary uh, uh, chain, why the amount of time that it takes is nu sub i. Okay, this is just back to this old thing about splitting and combining of Poisson processes. When you, uh, when you have a, a, a combined Poisson process, which is what you have here, when you're in state i, uh, there's a combined Poisson process which is running, which says uh, you go right with probability lambda, you go left with probability mu for an MM1Q. Uh, and you can look at it in terms of first you see uh, what the next state is, and then you ask how long did it take to get there, or you can look at it in terms of how long did it take to make a transition, and then which state did you go to. And with these combined Poisson processes, those two questions are independent of each other. Uh, and uh, if there's one thing you remember from all of this, please remember that because uh, it's something that you uh, use in almost every uh, problem that you do with Markov chains and Markov processes. It just comes up all the time. Okay, this final uh, version here uh, is looking at the, at the same, same Markov process, but looking at it in sample time uh, instead, of, uh, 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 instead of looking at the embedded queue. Now, the important thing here is when you look at it in sample time, you might not be able to do this because with this entire uh, uh, countable state Markov chain, uh, you might not be able to define these soft loop transition probabilities because these numbers might get too large. But for the MM1Q, you can do it. The important thing is that the steady state probabilities you find for these states are not the same as the steady state probabilities you find for the embedded Markov chain. They are, in fact, the same as the steady state probabilities for the Markov process itself. That's the, these steady state probabilities are the fraction of time that you spend in state J, and this is a sample time Markov process is the same, the fraction of time you spend in state J. Here, you have this embedded chain, and for example, in the embedded chain, the only place you can go from state one, from state zero, is state one. Here, from state zero, you can stay in state zero for a long time because here the increments of time are constant. Okay, we can look at the late renewal reward theorems for the renewal process to see what's going on here for the uh, for the fraction of time we spend in state J. Uh, we look at that picture up there. We start out in state J, for example, same as the renewal reward process that we had for a Markov chain. We get a reward of one for the amount of time that we stay in state J. After that, we're wandering around in the wilderness. We finally come back to state J again. We get one unit of reward times the amount of time that we spend here. In other words, we're accumulating reward uh, at a uh, rate of one unit per unit time and up to there. So the average reward we get per unit time is the expected value of u of j divided by the, uh, by the expected uh, inter, inter renewal time, which is one over nu j times the expected time from one renewal to the next, okay? Which tells us that the fraction of time we spend in state J is equal to the fraction of transitions that go to state J divided by the rate at which we leave state J times the expected number of overall transitions per unit time. This is, a, this is an important result because depending on what m sub i is, depending on what the number of transitions per unit time is, uh, it really tells you what's going on. Because all of these bizarre Markov processes that we've looked at uh, are bizarre because of the way that this behaves. This can be infinite or it can be zero. And at this point, 
we, we've been talking about the expected number of transitions per unit time as a, as a random variable, uh, as a limit in probability one, given that we start in state i. And suddenly, we see that it doesn't depend on i at all. Uh, so there is some number, m bar, which is the expected number of transitions per unit time, which is independent of what state we start in. And we call that m, m bar instead of m sub i. And that's this, that's this quantity here. And uh, what we get from that is the fraction of time we spend in state j is pi j over nu sub, it's, it's proportional to pi j over nu sub j, but since it has to add up to one, we have to divide it by this quantity here. And this quantity here is one over, this is the expected number of transitions per unit time. So, uh, and if we, uh, if we try to get the pi sub j's from the p sub j's, the corresponding thing is we find out that the expected number of transitions per unit time is a sum over i of p sub i times nu sub i. You can play all sorts of games with these equations. Uh, and when you do so, all of those things become evident. Uh, and. Uh, I would advise you to just cross this equation out. I don't, I don't know what it came from, but it's not, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what happens when the expected number of transitions per unit time is either zero or infinity. Uh, we, we had this case we looked at uh, of an MM1 type Q uh, where the server got rattled as time went on. And as the server got rattled with more and more customers waiting, the customers got discouraged and didn't come in. So we had a process where the longer the Q got, the, the longer time it took for anything to happen. So that the Q became uh, So that as far as the embedded Markov chain went, everything was fine. But then when we looked at the process itself, uh, the times that it took in each of these higher order states was so large uh, that as a process, it didn't make any sense. So the, so the p sub i's were all zero. The pi sub i's all looked fine. Uh, and uh, the other kind of cases where the expected number of transitions per unit time becomes infinite. Uh, and that's just the opposite kind of case where when you get to the higher ordered states, things start happening very, very fast. The higher ordered state you go to, the, the faster the transitions occur. It's like a small child. Uh, I mean, the more excited the small child gets, the faster things happen. And the faster things happen, the more excited the child gets. So pretty soon, Things are happening so fast, the child just collapses. Uh, and if you're lucky, the child sleeps. Uh, so you can think of it that way. OK, we talked about reversibility. And reversibility for Markov processes, I think, is somewhat easier to see than reversibility for Markov chains. Uh, if you're dealing with a, a if you're dealing with a Markov process, we're sitting in state i for a while. At some time, we make a transition. We go to state j. We sit there for a long time. Then we go to state k, and so forth. If we try to look at this process coming back the other way, we see that we're in state k. At a certain point, we have a transition. We have a transition into state j. And how long does it take before that transition is over? We're in state j, so the amount of time that it takes 
is an exponentially distributed random variable, and it's exponentially distributed with the same amount of time, whether we're coming in this way or whether we're coming in this way. And that's the notion of reversibility. It doesn't make any difference whether you look at it from right to left or from left to right. Uh, and in this kind of situation, if you find the steady state probabilities for the transitions, or you find the, uh, uh, or you find the steady state uh, fraction of time you spend in each state, I mean, we just showed that, that if you look at this process going backwards, if you define all the probabilities coming backwards, the uh, expected amount of time that you spend in state i, or the rate for leaving state i, is independent of right to left. And a slightly more complicated argument says the piece of i's are the same going right to left. And the fraction of time you spend in each state is obviously the same going from right to left if these limits occur. So that gives you all these bizarre conditions for queuing, uh, which are uh, which are very useful. OK, I'm not going to say any more about that except the guessing theorem. Uh, the guessing theorem says suppose a markup process is irreducible. Uh, you can check pretty easily whether it's irreducible or not. You can't necessarily check very easily whether it's, uh, whether it's recurrent. Uh, uh, and suppose p sub i is a set of probabilities that satisfies p sub i times q sub i j equals p sub j times q sub j i. In other words, this is the, this is the probability of being in state i and next transition is to state j. This is the probability of being in state j and next transition to state i. This says that if you can uh, find a set of probabilities which satisfy these equations, uh, and if they also satisfy the condition p sub i nu sub i less than infinity, uh, then p sub i is greater than zero for all i. p sub i is a steady state time average probability of state i. The process is reversible, and the embedded chain is positive recurrent. Okay, so it says all you have to do is solve those equations, and if you can solve those equations, uh, you're done. Uh, everything is uh, everything is fine. You don't have to uh, uh, you don't have to know anything about reversibility or uh, renewal theory or anything else. If you have that theorem, you just solve solve for those equations, solve these equations by guessing what the solution is, uh, and then you in fact have a reversible process. Uh, and uh, So the useful application of this is that all birth-death processes are reversible if this equation is satisfied. Uh, and uh, you can immediately find the steady state probabilities of them. OK, I'm not going to have much time for random walks. Uh, but random walks are what we've been talking about all term. We just didn't call them random walks until we got to the seventh chapter. But a random walk is a, a sequence of random variables uh, where each Sn in the sequence is a sum of some number of underlying uh, IID random variables, x1 up to x sub n. And we're interested in exponential bounds on S sub n for large n. These are known as Chernoff bounds. Uh, we talked about them back in chapter one. Uh, we're going to mention them again now. We're interested in threshold crossings. If you have two thresholds, one positive threshold, one negative threshold, you would like to know what's the, what's the stopping time when S sub n first crosses alpha, or what's the stopping time when it first crosses beta, what's the probability of crossing alpha before you cross beta, or vice versa, and what's the distribution of the overshoot when you pass one of them. So there are all those questions. Uh, we pretty much talked about the first two. Uh, the question of overshoot, uh, I think I mentioned this. Uh, the text doesn't say much about it. 
Uh, overshoot is just a nasty, nasty problem. Uh, if you ever have to find the overshoot of something, go look for a computer program to simulate it or something. Uh, uh, you're not going to solve the problem very easily. Uh, Fowler is the only book I know which does a reasonable job of trying to solve this. And you have to be extraordinarily patient. I mean, Feller does everything in the nicest possible way. Uh, or at least he always seems to do everything in the nicest possible way. Most, most textbooks you look at, after you understand the subject, you look at it and you say, oh, he should have done it this way. I've never had that experience with Feller at all. Uh, always, I look at it, I say, oh, there's an easier way to do it. I try to do it the easier way, and then I find something wrong with it. And then I go back and say, ah, you've got to do it the way Feller did it. So, uh, so if, you, if you're serious about this field uh, and you don't have a copy of this very old book, uh, get it because it's solid gold. OK, so suppose a random variable has a moment generating function. Uh, expected value of e to the zr uh, over some region, positive region of r. And suppose it has a, a mean which is negative. The Chernoff bound says that for any alpha greater than zero and any r in zero to r plus, the probability that z is greater than or equal to alpha is less than or equal to this quantity here. Remember, we derived this, the, the derivation is very simple. Uh, it's a sort of an obvious result. Uh, it's a little strange because this says that for this random variable, the, its, its complementary distribution function has to go down as e to the minus r alpha. Now, all random variables can't go down exponentially as e to the minus r alpha. The reason for this is that uh, these moment generating functions don't exist for all alpha. So what it's really saying is, is where it exists, uh, it goes down with alpha as e to the minus r alpha. We then define this semi-invariant moment generating function. And then a more convenient way of stating the Chernoff bound was in this way. You look here, and you say, for a fixed value of n here, uh, this probability that S sub n is greater than or equal to n a is something which is going down exponentially with n. And if you optimize over r, this bound is exponentially tight. In other words, if you, uh, if you try to replace this with anything smaller, namely which goes down faster, then for large enough n, the bound will be false. OK, so this is, this is the tightest bound you can get when you optimize it over r. So it's exponential in n. Uh, mostly, we wanted to use it for threshold crossings. And for threshold crossings, we would like to look at it in another way. And we dealt with this graphically. Uh, probability of Sn greater than or equal to alpha. Now what we want to do is hold alpha constant Alpha is some threshold up there. We want to ask, what's the probability that after n trials, we're sitting above alpha? And we'd like to try to solve that for different values of n. <coughs> the Chernoff bound, in this case, this quantity here, is this intercept here. Uh, you take the semi-invariant moment generating function. It's convex. You draw this <coughs> curve. Uh, you take a tangent of slope alpha over n. Uh, and you see where it hits here. And this is the exponent that you have. This is the negative exponent. As you vary n, this tilts around on this curve. And it comes in to this point. It goes back out again. Uh, that's what happens to it. Uh, and that uh, smallest exponent, as you vary n, is the most likely time at which you're going to cross that threshold. And what we found from looking at Walt's equality uh, is that, let me go on, because we're running out of time. Hmm. 
Walt's identity for two thresholds says this, and the corollary says if the underlying random variable is less than zero, and if the R at which the, 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 the second solution of gamma of R equals zero. Uh, you have this convex curve. Gamma of zero is always equal to zero. Uh, there's some other value of, of R for which gamma is equal to zero, and that's R star. And this says that the probability that we have crossed alpha uh, at time j, where j is the time of first crossing, is less than or equal to e to the minus alpha r star. This bound is tight also. Uh, and that's a very nice result, because that just says uh, uh, all you got to do is find r star, and that tells you what the probability of crossing a threshold is. And it's a very tight bound if alpha is very large. Doesn't make any difference what the uh, negative threshold is or whether it's there or not. Uh, this tells you the thing you want to know. OK, I think I'm going to stop at that point because I have uh, I've been sort of rushing uh, to get to this point, and it uh, doesn't do any good to keep r rushing. So uh, thank you all for uh, being around all term. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.